One of the things that I've heard from so many hiring managers and I've experienced myself being on the interviewer side of the table is why is it important to answer the question that they ask? <laughs> why? What happens? What usually happens? You can answer that one. <laughs> Well, I mean, here's the thing, right? Oh, Maybe it's the nerves of doing the job interview. True. Maybe you're thrown off by the question. But when someone asks you a specific question, you want to give a specific answer. You don't want a politician answer where you're deflecting it and saying, yeah, I, you know, I worked on that a couple of years ago and it was great and all that stuff. You want to get into the details. Yes, I did some research on the double burden of malnutrition. I use X statistical software. This is the ethical protocols I cleared and walk them through the steps of what you did and talk about the specifics and answer the question. This is the Public Health Insight Podcast. Before we move on, it is important to note that the views expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent any of the organizations we work for or are affiliated with. You're listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for all things public health and global health. From the sustainable development goals to the social determinants of health, as well as interesting dialogues about the diverse career opportunities that exist in these fields. Remember to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify so other people like you can benefit from our content. My name is LaShawn, your host for this episode, alongside my co-host, Gordon. What's going on, Gordon? Life's good. Life. How about you? Life's good, LG? Okay. LG. Let's go. So, speaking of, you know, getting a job interview, getting a job. What are some of these main reasons candidates don't get the job after, after doing these interviews? That's a good question. One of the interesting things about getting job offers from job interviews, if you apply, for example, a government job and it was a permanent full-time job, there is a situation there where internal candidates will get preference. In fact, some applications you'll actually see that said in the application that internal candidates will be given preference. So if you're only applying for those permanent full-time jobs and keep in mind internal candidates will get preference, you're fighting an uphill battle where it's just a formality why the posting is out there in the first place, and they may have already decided to give it to an in internal person. Diversify your job applications to not only include those highly coveted permanent full-time positions. What about you, Lashan? Anything you have to say about that? It makes sense. Different organizations have different policies and procedures, and sometimes it's hard to tell whether these organizations have these internal processes and internal preferences compared to those that don't. So... Yeah, that's a tough one. I would say one of the main reasons candidates don't get job offers after doing job interviews is really a lack of understanding of the position. Some people go into the interview and I don't know what they're expecting, but they should have probably prepared a bit based on some of the job descriptions or maybe they have talked to people who have done similar interviews before for some guidance and some tips. But, you know, you have to come prepared with some of the basics, right? And what do I mean by the basics, okay? Read the job description, okay? What will that give you? It's going to give you everything you need to be successful in that job interview, okay? Minus the external research you have to do on the organization. If this position is focused on your ability to do research and quantitative skills, you sure as hell are going to want to brush up on those quantitative skills, how to do statistical analysis, the different tests you could do, the different methods that are in that job description. You want to have a good understanding on a theoretical level and a practical level, just in case they ask you, hey, walk us through how you would do this. And then you're just shocked, uh -oh. right? You don't want to get in that position. So what I often do is I go through each job description. I highlight all the key themes, concepts, skills, competencies that I need. Okay, do I need to demonstrate that I know how to do R, use R um, programming or R statistical analysis, or there's so many different softwares you could use. Well, if that's a part of the description, brush up on it. And you could do that in many ways. Check your old notes, go on YouTube, take a quick course on it, on a free course on Coursera at edX, just to show that you can have the conversation about that 
right? Because when they start asking technical questions, you're going to have to know. The the more conceptual questions, sure, you might already have a good grasp on. But when, when they start asking you to do, and I know Gordon may have done this in the past where they asked him to do more of technical test and do some analysis on a computer and more. Yeah, it wasn't just like a verbal kind of situation. Can you tell us a bit about how that went and your experience with that? Yeah, I for my first job after when I was about to graduate from my MPH, I applied for a health promotion specialist position. And there were several different components to that job interview. So the first thing was you had to prepare a presentation I think it was a five or 10 minute presentation on a public health topic to present to the interviewers. Then you had to get interviewed. And then after the interview, there was a written test that I had to do regarding, it was just a public health question. How would you go about an intervention uh, that tackles the social determinants of health or whatever, whatever. So they wanted to test your oral speaking, your comfort doing presentations, obviously assessing your fit through the interview and then how sharp you were at like brainstorming and coming up with something on the fly. So there's multiple components to this. And I think what this all ties back to is you have to also relate your answers back to the job posting. And LaShawn kind of mentioned this before. So if you're asked a question about, and this is something I learned recently, um, if you're asked a question about, oh, how do you handle conflict or how would you go about analyzing a data set or whatever? Talk about it from your previous experience and also link it to something you saw in the posting. So what I would do, for example, is I would go through my whole spiel. I'd say, yeah, in my previous job, I was working on this project and then this project, da, 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 da. And I would say, yeah, this is relevant to this position because as part of this position, you're looking at data sets for child and maternal health. And I think at the end of all of my answers, I always bring it back to something that was listed on the job posting so that they can remember that I know why I'm here. Another thing too, LaShawn, we know people who've applied to jobs, not save the job posting or the job description and completely have no idea why they're at an interview or what they're interviewing for. So anytime you apply for a job, make sure you save the job posting or the job description because sometimes, depending on what portal it's on, it disappears and you don't know what you're interviewing for. So never, ever make that mistake. Yeah, no, I absolutely love those points. Make sure you save those job postings. One of the things that I've heard from so many hiring managers and I've experienced myself being on the interviewer side of the table is why is it important to answer the question that they ask? <laughs> why? What happens? What usually happens? You can answer that one. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing, right? Maybe it's the nerves. Oh, oh, maybe it's the nerves of doing the job interview. True. Maybe it's you're not really sure and you're thrown off by the question. But when someone asks you a specific question, you want to give a specific answer. You don't want a politician answer where you're deflecting it and saying, yeah, I, you know, I worked on that a couple of years ago and it was great and all that stuff. You want to get into the details. Yes, I did some research on the double burden of malnutrition. I use X statistical software. I worked on this data set. This is how I got the data set. This is the ethical protocols I cleared. And walk them through the steps of what you did and talk about the specifics and answer the, the question, right? Because they're just looking for an answer to that question. And they've used that question on multiple people. And they have given answers specific to that question. And if you're going to give an answer that's on left field that doesn't even answer the question, they're going to be like, what the heck is going on here, right? They're asking those questions for a specific reason and they want an answer. But if you avoid that answer, that's a red flag. And part of it is too, having the confidence. So what I found from doing interviews, it's in your best interest to convince yourself that it's just a normal conversation and you just met someone over coffee and they just asked you to tell you about your previous job. Once you start looking at it as a performance thing and I have to wow, you put unnecessary pressure on yourself. All they're really asking is, hey, what did you do? Tell us, uh, you're, you know, we're excited to interview you. Tell us what you were doing previous to this and why it's related to this. That's pretty much what the interview comes down to. So when you kind of put that conversational tone in yourself, you can relax a little bit, be a little bit more flowy and be a little bit more confident. 
So that's what I would say is important. You can ask the interviewer if you can come back to a question later. That's something I only started to do recently. And even taking notes, mm. I, I thought that was completely taboo. I would stay away from it. I had you know nice chats with some of my colleagues who have encouraged me that that is something that is acceptable to do. And asking them to repeat the question. Those are the three things that I've been doing recently. And I no longer have to worry about, oh, if I didn't hear the question the first time, then I'm, you know, it's the game over for me because I can just re-ask them the question. And sometimes they even state it in a different way that's more understandable. So just take your time with it. Try to answer the questions as best as possible. That makes so much sense. And I, I really like the the part about being able to take notes. And one thing you can always ask if you're unsure is just ask them, hey, is it okay if I take notes on the side here, if it's in person or on Zoom? And most of the time they will understand why and they'll appreciate you asking, right? So because that the reason is you don't want, when they're asking a question, you don't want to be looking down, right? Absolutely. They want at least tell them beforehand what you're doing. So they're like, oh, what's going on there? It's kind of weird. But like, if you let them know, they'll understand, right? So what, what, tell me about another reason about why you think people don't land any offers after an interview. Are there any other kind of more behavioral reasons? Yeah, I would even, one of the things I would say, given that we're now in this virtual environment and a lot of interviews are happening remotely, is be aware of your background and your settings. So if you have an interview that's coming up, do you want to be taking that interview in the washroom, in, in the car? You, you want to have a very professional background while you're doing the interview. And this is just to avoid distractions for the interviewer. Different people have different circumstances. You might have a lot of people at home. You might be in a precarious situation. That's totally understandable. But you just want to minimize the level of distractions for your interviewer and not give them any arbitrary reasons to not consider you for the position. So that's one of the things I would say, too. In Zoom etiquette, so Zoom, WebEx, or whatever you're using for your interview, look into the camera. Look at them. Not be too shifty. Not be spinning around in your chair. Try to stay grounded and and be present you want to just avoid distractions and be as engaging as possible but i know one of the other important things that you would love to talk about Lashawn, in the broader context is just poor body language what does that look like from your experience and what you've heard from my experience especially you could tell when someone is not really into the position and it shows quite quite easily right like even the tone of your voice and the types of questions you may ask during an interview, they could tell. Like if you're going to ask me, you know, how many hours do I need to work for this position I, right off the interview? Like it's not <laughs> the best question to ask. You want to come off as someone who is keen and ready to do what it takes to be successful at this position. So th that's the main thing. And like you want to show your passion for that position because if you were to pick between two people, one person that was, you know, on the fence and one person that was very passionate, all things equal, you'd want to pick someone who's passionate and, you know, engaged in the job. And of course, as Dr. Sajjad Fazil pointed out, there is a problem with being too passionate and over passionate and come off as inauthentic. So you want to be careful about that. And, you know, like Gordon mentioned, in terms of the poor body language, sit up, right? Try your best to have a good environment to do your Zoom call in. And one of the things is also make sure you can get some sort of stable connection, whether it's going to your local library, your school, a friend's house, or finding a quiet place because it could really throw off the flow of an interview if you cut out, especially in the online setting. Ooh. Good thing you don't have to worry about internet in like real life, real in-person interviews. Imagine that you just start lagging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a challenge one time with getting my mic to work and... It was a whole nightmare. So these are some things you want to test out before you go to the interview. Just to minimize the stress, I find that they're generally understanding for certain technical issues, but it stresses you out and throws you off your game. So you want to minimize that. Okay. So we talked about some of these main reasons people don't get job offers after doing interviews. Now, after the interview itself, woohoo! typically... If they like you and they're ready to go on to the next step, they often contact your references. 
Can you tell us a bit about the process of choosing references and the importance of this stage and the whole overall process of landing that job? Yes. And before you even get to that point and right after the interview, within 24 to 48 hours, you want to send a thank you note to the interviewer. And if there were any unanswered questions or anything that you felt you could have done better at, an email is also a good place to state that. They don't want a manifesto or anything like that. Just a quick, nice email, very concise, and just to you know, let them know that you're still interested in the position and that you're still enthusiastic about it. Once they've narrowed down their candidate pool, usually to two or three people, and they rank them, and they usually start with the references of the person or the candidate that they rank as number one. And if there is a red flag, and if for some reason something doesn't check out, they could move on to their secondary candidate. But if they have contacted your references, it is a good sign. Keep in mind, this is different from requesting your reference list and actually contacting your references. They'll request a reference list, perhaps from everyone, the, the two or three people that are being considered after the interview, but they typically only contact the references of the number one candidate first before moving on to the others. So what are some good practices to make sure you choose the right references? The right references will be specific to your job application. So the most prominent experiences that you have on your resume or cover letter ideally are the ones that you're also using as your reference. You don't really want to have a reference for a position that wasn't even relevant enough to make it on your your job application. So you want to put some thought into what that looks like ahead of time. And also let them know before that you are planning to use them Mm. as a job reference and let them know what the position is for and perhaps what skills you would like them to highlight that was relevant to your work with that specific reference. Yeah, I really like that. And oftentimes I like having a diversity of references, one maybe more technical based and one more personality based. Uh, But it depends on the situation. And yes, it's nice to touch base and let them know that you are considering using them as a reference and give them a few highlights of that position and some of the key strengths like you mentioned, Gordon. Uh, Is there anything else you wanted to mention? I know uh, you wanted to also talk about what are some of the reasons people are able to get interviews, but then they don't get into some of the, the job offer stage. So was there anything in particular you wanted to add about that? Yeah, so if you're getting interviews with a certain degree of frequency, that is a good sign that your job applications are competitive and that it's clear on paper why you could be a fit for the position. Now, if you're getting a lot of interviews but no offers, it stands to reason that there might be something in the interview process that might be getting in your way. Perhaps you're not sending a thank you email. Maybe you don't follow up. Maybe you're not relating your answers back to the position that you're applying for. Maybe even the body language thing that LaShawn mentioned, it's okay to smile during your answers. Sometimes LaShawn and I, we're getting super confident and we might read the room and throw in little jokes to the people interviewing us, but you have to read the room to know if it's Mm. appropriate and what kind of jokes you can tell. Mm. So little things like that to mix it up to just show that you're a dynamic personality because at the end of the day, they want to know how fun or how effective you're going to be as a worker? How are you going to enhance the work culture? Are you someone that's good to work with? Those are some of the, aside from the technical skills and the subject matter expertise, are you a positive addition to the workplace culture? And that's something that they typically want to see. And that's something that purely for the sake of answering job interview questions that you might not be able to demonstrate. So you might want to figure out ways in your job interview just to show the impact you've had on your colleagues from your previous workplaces, or even build some extra rapport where it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. No, fantastic. And as Dr. Greg Martin always says, you want to let them know that you're the type of person who can get anything done, and I get stuff done, and I get along well with people. So those are two things to highlight as well. All right, Gordon, are there any last words from you about this? If you're getting interviews, that's a good thing. Uh, If you're not getting job offers from your interviews, that's obviously not a good thing. But it just goes to show that there's room room for growth, opportunities for improvement, and just be open and mindful that you can get better. 
I know that LinkedIn does have a free video interview coaching tool on their website. Uh, we can include a link to that in the description if you want to check it out for some support. Uh, so yeah, good luck on your next set of interviews. All righty. And my last words would just be trust the process and do some research before your job interview and get some practice. You get better over time. And if you need some additional guidance, feel free to set up office hours at the publichealthinsight.com and set up a time, book a time to talk to Gordon and myself, and we can get into a bit more details on tips and strategies you can use during your job interviews to land that job. My name is LaShawn, and this has been the Public Health Insight Podcast. Yeah, what, what, was it? what do you say? So you just say, this is Gordon and LaShawn, or LaShawn uh, and Gordon? Yep, yeah. this is LaShawn and Gordon. <laughs> I, I love how you Loopers. always do it. You're like, yep, this is LaShawn and Gordon <laughs> signing off. Peace. Peace. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. See you in the next one.